Okay. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Federal Resources for Highway Infrastructure Resilience. Before we begin the webinar, we'd like to start with some quick housekeeping tips. We are recording this webinar today and you will receive a copy of the recording along with the presentation files after the event. Because we have placed everyone in listen only mode, we encourage you to please submit your questions using the Q&A panel in Zoom. We have saved time at the end and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Now let's get started. I will pass it over to our moderator, Jim Avitable. Jim will kick us off with the webinar. Jim Avitable serves as a member of RSNH's infrastructure strategy team. He is responsible for identifying the industry trends most deeply impacting our client, clients and public agencies. Jim's experiences crosses all modes and disciplines of infrastructure from project development to implementation for complex highways, bridges, toll roads, rail and transit facilities. Jim is an advocate for sustainability and resili resilience infrastructure and actively seeks cost-effective methods to reduce greenhouse gases, emissions, and improve the environment through quality design. Take it away, Jim. Thank you, Dana, I appreciate that. Um, good morning to our mountain region and West Coast listeners, and good afternoon to those of you closer to the East Coast. And welcome to RSNH's Federal Resources for Highway Infrastructure Resilience webinar. This is the first of a series where we're planning on highlighting public agencies leading the charge and sharing information on infrastructure resilience. Our agenda today includes the following. I'll introduce our speakers. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the overview of resilience and sustainability and their importance, specifically resilience in highway infrastructure, some of the available funding programs in the BIL, and Jennifer Carver is gonna give us a detailed presentation on the FDOT's resilience program, how they're using these federal programs. And our panelists will do an interactive discussion on it how to deliver on our uh, uh, resiliency plans. And then it'll be an opportunity for questions and answers from the audience. So our speakers today, in addition to myself, um, I'd like to introduce Tom Everett. Tom is an internationally recognized transportation authority who offers a lifetime of engineering and policy experience. Formerly the executive director of FHWA administration, um, Tom has joined RSNH as Vice President and Strategy, where he leads new business group and strategy development across aviation, federal transportation, and construction management markets. Tom is an accomplished leader who has proven steady leadership through major crises over 30 years. He has a broad range of engineering and transportation experience with core competencies in bridge and highway design, construction, and maintenance. Also, Jennifer Carver. Jennifer serves as statewide resilience planning coordinator for Florida Department of Transportation Office of Policy Planning. Jennifer coordinates FDOT's resilience planning efforts and has over 25 years experience in planning and public engagement, including land use, transportation, resilience, hazard mitigation, coastal environmental management, parks and recreation. She has a bachelor's degree in political science and Spanish from Santa Clara University and a master's in city and regional planning from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Sustainability and resilience are not exactly the same, yet they tend to overlap. One focuses on the cause and another one more on the effect. Although the planning and design community have been stressing the importance of sustainable sustainability and resilience for some time, these two topics have taken on new meaning as the effects of climate change have become so broadly experienced. Our recent experience with the global pandemic has proven evidence of how sustainable sustainability, economics, supply chain, climate, disruptive technology, and public health are deeply interconnected and the right investments can lead to a more sustainable outcome. Why is sustainability and resilience and in infrastructure so important? Regardless of where you live or work, extreme weather is impacting our daily lives. The National Bureau of Economic Research estimates that up to 10% of GDP and $226 billion wasted um, on property losses tied to climate change, and also 910 million 
hours are lost annually, okay, due to climate change. But a more recent study by EPA stresses how proper mitigation can impact these figures and that doing nothing will result in spiral costs, for property damage, annual losses in productivity, and public health costs that eclipse these numbers. No region in the United States or globally will escape unaffected. At RSNH, we take the health and well being of our employees very seriously, and so do our public agency clients. Our ESG group has estimated that a large percentage of our staff reside in areas vulnerable to climate change. And 82% of our offices are located in communities where municipal and sustainable programs exist. Many of the communities we live in have established sustainability and resilience programs, and RSNH is working with them towards achieving their goals. But doing nothing will cost us. The following chart was taken from the 2019 November monthly FEMA report to Congress. Federal Emergency Management Agency is obligated to share annual reports and monthly reports with expenditures related to disaster recovery to our elected officials. Over the years, these figures have become astronomical. This was one of the last reports issued prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. As you can see from the projected expenditures, post-disaster recovery spending was the primary focus of federal spending, while disaster mitigation was almost non-existent. But in 2020, the Build Resilient Infrastructure in Our Communities BRIC program was initiated, and this trend has since started to shift. The bipartisan infrastructure law legislation helps expand upon this trend with new programs, and you'll hear about those in today's presentations. Funding resilience is good business. The Institute of Business Science, which conducts multiple post-disaster evaluations on infrastructure, reports that $1 spent on infrastructure resilience saves one, $6 in future disaster recovery costs. These figures are becoming well-published and private businesses understand the benefits of investing in operational resilience, IT platforms, cybersecurity, and other ways to fortify resilience in our business activities. Infrastructure is no different. Our insurance industry is mandating increased resilience and our customers and Corporate, corporate leaders understand the importance of it and support it. Now with that, I'll introduce Mr. Everett to discuss the federal programs and assist addressing resilience. Oops, thank you, Jim. I clicked too, uh, too quickly on the slide control, but hello everyone. Uh, welcome again to the, to the presentation today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk about highway infrastructure resilience uh, and the federal funding that's associated with that. And I emphasize the word highway because this is not intended to cover every possible federal source of funding for resilience. Uh, so we're gonna limit the scope, at least in my conversation, uh, on the funding sources to, to those associated with highways. So as Jim was talking about the, the impacts to uh, our highway infrastructure because of uh, climate change are just staggering. We've seemed to have experienced just like a continual sequence of hurricanes and floods and wildfires and other extreme events that really has disrupted communities, certainly impact, uh, impacted our uh, infrastructure and our highway system, and um, tragically claimed a lot of lives. So let's take a look at some statistics that I pulled from NOAA, their National Center for in Environmental Information. In the U.S., we've experienced 338 weather-related and, and climate-related disasters since 1980, where the overall cost reached $1 billion, 338 of those disasters. The total cost of these disasters is even more shocking because it exceeds $2.3 trillion. And that data is, is the latest. Um, when I say that, it, it includes the hurricanes Fiona and Ian that we experienced um, not that long ago. Climate change and extreme weather events impact transportation uh, in different ways, and uh, they vary by location. Jim touched on that a little bit. 
Areas that see higher temperatures or increased exposure to storm events often see degradation of pavements, resulting in shorter replacement cycles and certainly higher maintenance costs. Areas that see storm surge uh, often see damage to the substructure of roads and, and bridges requiring earlier than anticipated repair or replacement. We know what high winds can do. They wreak havoc on traffic signals and road signs and just fill the roads with debris following um, some of these events. And that's um, not only a mess to clean up, but uh, very impactful on the operation of our, our highways. Heavy rain, changes in precipitation intensity, sea level rise, they all can result in flooding of roads and damage to culverts is, is quite often the uh, outcome and other drainage infrastructure. And it really seems that no area of the country uh, is safe from the damages that, that we're talking about. And um, more and more areas are seeing these, these types of damage from extreme, high, uh, extreme weather events. The need to make our highway system resilient to these events, it's not localized, it's national. So what can infrastructure owners do? Well, it starts with uh, understanding and assessing the risks and vulnerabilities. And second, identifying some mitigation strategies. Sounds simple, two steps, but in reality, it is very time consuming and resource intensive, yet it's something that is so important that it can't be ignored. There are multiple ways to categorize various mitigation strategies. I came up with four that I'm, I'm just gonna describe here and show on this slide. Now I'd say you could probably put most resilience mitigation into one of these four categories. So you can always adopt design and retrofit practices to prepare for and adapt to climate changes. I think when we get to Jennifer's presentation, you'll hear, hear some of what uh, Florida DOT has done. You can add redundancy to the transportation network by building some new connections and new options when one when you lose one uh, part of your, of your infrastructure, uh, having some redundancy is, is an option. You can move transportation assets out of vulnerable locations to less vulnerable locations. Um, it's, a, it's a broad and drastic move, but sometimes that's about the only option you have. And then you can always adopt some comprehensive maintenance and operational strategies to help address uh, the disruptions that occur. In the highway transportation arena, planning, design, and construction activities that support each of these strategies that I just talked about are typically eligible for reimbursement under the Federal Aid Highway Program. I hate to show a list, but here's a list. And uh, I'll just start by saying it's not all inclusive, but it certainly gives you an idea of the range of activities that can be funded. Um, and, and it ranges, as, as I talked about, from those vulnerability assessments that are a key early step to the complete relocation of facilities to less vulnerable locations and about everything you can think of uh, in between. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, uh, contains several new programs targeted at mitigating the impacts of climate change and increasing resilience of our transportation system. Funding for these programs is both apportioned or distributed to the states based on formulas that are spelled out in law, as well as um, some programs have competitive grants. So it's an application process. Um, projects are submitted and competed for, and, and uh, if they're lucky, receive awards. So when looking at, at potential sources of federal funding for resilience activities, really for any activity, it's always important to understand the definitions of key terms that are used within the law that establish the programs. You know, resilience um, is one of those terms that's uh, used differently across the country. It, there are different definitions, but really when you're looking at funding, the only one that matters is the, is the one that the federal government has defined for that program. And when, when the law doesn't provide a specific definition, usually we look to the agency that's responsible for carrying out that program to define terms through policy. So in December of 2014, the Federal Highway Administration defined the terms resilience and ad adaptation as, as shown on this slide. 
Resilience uh, or resiliency is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions. Again, a very broad definition, which connects back to the broad range of eligible activities. Adaptations used in the law, it's not necessarily tied um, to eligibility in all cases, but enough so that it needs a uh, definition to make sure we stay within the bounds of the definition. And that's an adjustment in natural human systems in anticipation of or response to a changing environment in a way that effectively uses beneficial opportunities or reduces negative effects. So let's start talking about three new programs that um, federal, again, federal highway programs that are climate and resilience uh, focused. And let's start by looking at PROTECT. This program, I think, wins the award for the best acronym, uh, Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation. The uh, name actually is very representative of what the program is all about. The program aims to help make surface transportation more resilient to natural hazards, which include climate change and sea level rise and flooding and all those extreme weather events that I've talked about. Through uh, again, a range of activities, starting with planning activities, um, resilience improvements, so that's more of the hard uh, construction, and then activities to protect evacuation routes and at-risk coastal infrastructure. The funding, $7.3 billion, gets distributed to state DOTs by formula, and then another $1.4 billion is through those competitive grants that I talked about can be used on highway projects, public transportation facilities or services, or even port facilities. The, comp the competitive portion of that program includes planning grants for vulnerability assessments and emergency response strategies to address those vulnerabilities. And I, as, as far as the status, the states have received their FY22 and 23 apportionments for this program. And the competitive program, to last I've checked, um, has not been rolled out yet by DOT. Carbon reduction program. The purpose of this program is to reduce transportation emissions through the development of a state carbon reduction strategy and by funding projects that are designed to reduce transportation emissions. $6.4 billion in funding is over five years. Again, it's going to be distributed by formula to the states. Interesting part of this program is that a carbon reduction strategy is required, but it's not required until November of 2023. And you have to work with the MPOs uh, within your state to develop that strategy. So the funding is already out for two years and the, the strategies haven't even been developed yet. And so, I think what will be important there as the strategies are developed is to show that the pro the projects you're using those funds for um, is al they're aligned with the strategy that you eventually develop by November 2023. So, what, <laughs> excuse me, what are some of those projects? The construction, planning, design of trail facilities uh, for pedestrians or bikes, other non-motorized forms of transportation. That's one example. Uh, deployment of infrastructure-based ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems, the installation of vehicle to infrastructure communications equipment, uh, project to replace street lighting and traffic control devices with energy efficient alternatives is another example, or a project that supports the deployment of alternative fuel vehicles, which includes purchasing, installing, and operating publicly accessible EV charging stations. Again, these are just examples. I don't like lists, but everybody wants to know what's an example of the type of project that we can fund with this, with this money. And so there you go, there's a few. The next uh, and third program I wanted to mention is uh, what we call NEVI, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Program. NEVI is going to provide $5 billion in dedicated funding by formula to the states to strategically deploy EV charging infrastructure and establish an interconnected network to facilitate data collection, data access, and reliability of the data. 
States are required to have an approved electric vehicle infrastructure deployment plan uh, describing how they're going to use this money, and they all do. All the states have uh, an approved plan. Initially, the funding under this program is directed to those alternative fuel corridors for electric vehicles to build out this network, particularly along the interstate highway system. And then once the goals on the national network are met, Funding can be used on any public road in any other uh, publicly accessible location. But there is also a competitive grants aspect of this program. So 10% of the funding amounts for each fiscal year um, is available to states and local governments that need additional assistance. And again, latest status that I've checked is uh, no guidance has come out yet on the competitive program. An important thing to remember is that there were several programs that existed prior to IIJA that offer funding for resilience activities. And I want to talk about three. The first is the National Highway Performance Program. Program purpose here is to support activities that increase resiliency of the national highway system and um, to mitigate against the, the cost of damages. Uh, from climate change and, and these extreme weather events that I've talked about. Now, it's there, the funds here are, are intended to focus on the national highway system routes. The IIJA added a new purpose, and it's specifically to provide support for activities to increase the resiliency of those national highway system routes. Under IIJA, the program receives $148 billion over five years, and again, it's distributed by formula to the states. States, here's, here's an interesting part, states may use up to 15% of their funds each year for protective features on a non-NHS federal aid highway or bridge. So in recognition of the importance of protecting um, our facilities, especially those on the NHS, Congress opened this program up, put a limit on it, 15%, uh, but opened that up for protective features on these non-NHS routes. To use NHPP funds, there are some strings attached. Uh, states have to have an, a transportation asset management plan or a TAMP, and extreme weather and resilience are required to be considered as part of those TAMPs, the life cycle cost and risk management uh, portions of analysis that are included in those TAMPs. This, the second existing pre-IIJA program that can be used for resilience is the uh, STBGP, or Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. It dates back to MAP21, I believe, when this program was uh, first set up, and it was continued in the FAST Act, and now again in IIJA. This program gets $72 billion over five years, again by formula to the states. Of all the federal aid highway funding, this is by far the most flexible funding available. The range of activities is very broad and certainly includes addressing resilience needs. And the last program I wanted to talk about is emergency relief. I think many people on the call are probably familiar with this program. It's a longstanding program and it provides funds for emergency repairs or permanent or and permanent, I should say, uh, required because of a natural disaster or a catastrophic failure from some external cause. Protective features are eligible and encouraged. It's funded at $100 million a year, but that's my opinion, just to keep the program established, because the needs far exceed $100 million per year. And what Congress usually does is check in with Federal Highway Administration about current needs and then pass some sort of a supplemental funding bill. Uh, some of those bills have been uh, billions of dollars. So it is a lot of money. But if you do just at the law of what's authorized in the law, it doesn't seem like much. But it is a significant program. Funds are awarded through a needs-based allocation of funds. It's not a formula. And there, there are processes in place through the states to actually demonstrate those needs. At this point, I've covered the federal funding resources that are available, and I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer. 
Great, thank you, Tom. I'm so happy to be here today to give you a little bit of an overview about the Florida Department of Transportation's Transportation Asset Management Planning and our Resilience Planning and Implementation Initiative. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions. So as you all know, every state is required to have a long-range transportation plan. Ours is called the Florida Transportation Plan. And in it, for the last several cycles, we've had a goal related to agile, resilient, and quality transportation infrastructure. So we have a family of plans that includes not just the Florida Transportation Plan in its various elements, but also our uh, strategic Highway Safety Plan, our Seaports Plan, our Freight Mobility and Trade Plan, and our, our other statewide plans that also incorporate resilience, including the Transportation Asset Management Plan. So we've been working for quite a while to incorporate resilience into our work. And we did adopt an agency policy back in 2020 to incorporate resilience into our business and we defined resilience as the ability to adapt to changing conditions, prepare for, withstand, and recover from disruption. So we're looking at kind of the whole gamut of activities that relate to incorporating resilience. Our, our policy focuses on storms, flooding, and sea level rise, the kind of water-related hazards, but we do look at other hazards in our planning activities and, and in our design and implementation. So the policy directs us to incorporate resilience into all of our business, which we've been working on uh, over, over the years and also identifying ways that we have already been incorporating resilience. So you may recognize some of these graphics. This is the rainfall amounts from Hurricane Ian that crossed through Florida back in October. And you can see it was a lot of rain, a lot of impacts. And I'm sure that you've seen pictures. Um, this is a little bit just to show that it was not just coastal. Um, our hazards in Florida are, you know, all across the board, inland, coastal areas, and so we're looking at ways to address those as well. Some pictures, you probably have seen some of these. Again, it's coastal and inland impacts from Ian, and then we right away had Hurricane Nicole come along after that. That caused even more impacts, especially in some of the areas that had not recovered yet from Hurricane Ian. So um, in our transportation asset management plan, as um, Tom mentioned earlier, everyone, every state needs to have a transportation asset management plan. And we have a number of features related to uh, addressing our assets, including risk analysis and investment strategies and all of those. And uh, we have recently been looking to enhance that in relation to some of the additional requirements to incorporate resilience. So we already had a risk register and, and life cycle and work types, but we're looking to enhance those to better address resilience as well. And we do have a, a chart in there, some risk registers and risk tolerance that identify risks uh, and likelihood and consequences. And we're looking at, I'll talk a little bit more about our resilience action plan that's going to give us some additional information to incorporate into the transportation asset management plan to better address this. We are including uh, in our transportation asset management plan, we have a new chapter on managing risk and creating resilience that's incorporating more of the concepts related to resilience than were in there before and will enhance that as we move forward. So we learned a lot making sure uh, with, the, with the TAMP, making sure that we have the right people from all across the agency on the team, that we're communicating a lot and we're trying to cross train so that people across the agency understand risk and resilience and, and asset management. And it's really an iterative effort and, and takes a lot of time. 
So now I want to transition into a little more about our specific actions related to resilience. We've had a lot of activities going on over the years uh, related to implementing our Florida transportation plan, implementing our policy, uh, incorporating resilience into our statewide planning, also developing our tools, including one related to sea level rise. That's an online tool. We conduct a lot of research in Florida and also are involved in national research projects and CHRP panels and others that are addressing resilience. And these are amazing uh, tools that give some information to, for us to incorporate into our processes. We've also been doing a lot of collaboration in the state um, with, with other state agencies, with our local and regional partners that are working on resilience, and also with other states. There's a lot to be learned, and that communication is really essential as we move forward. We have identified that a lot of the things we were already doing were resilient or incorporating resilient in, into our projects. And, and our work already. And we have started to kind of call out those things as resilience measures and identify those things that we were already doing. We weren't necessarily calling them resilience, but they really are resilient. Some examples here include roundabouts, which are also sustainable, uh, pavement markings, you know, our, our high mass lighting. We've been responding to hurricanes and other uh, hazard issues for, for years. So we've started incorporating uh, resilience considerations into our manuals and our procedures, looking at nature-based solutions where those are appropriate and can really enhance the environment while focusing on improving our communities. So that local partner coordination on here is, is really one of the keys that we need to address in our resilience efforts and our focus at Florida DOT is a lot on how we are helping our communities be more economically viable and be resilient. And, and this is just a high priority for us. As I mentioned, we've incorporated resiliency considerations into some of our, our manuals and are continuing to evaluate our manuals and our policies. A little background on kind of where resiliency is going at the state level as well. There's a lot going on, as you can imagine, in Florida, not just with the Florida Department of Transportation, but our legislature, our governor's office, and our other agencies are also working very hard and very interested in, in helping our state and our communities. So there is a requirement that was passed a couple of years ago to require any state finance construction in an area called the coastal building zone to do a sea level impact projection study to identify ways that the project might be affected by sea level rise and options for making modifications to improve resilience. There is a large resilient Florida program that's managed out of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection that provides grants and planning and infrastructure and is look, doing a vulnerability assessment to address resilience uh, and working a lot with our partners around the state and our communities. Our governor, when he first came into office, established or appointed a chief resilience officer. And then in legislation last spring, the resilience office was officially established and the chief resilience officer um, is in the governor's office. And that legislation also included a requirement for the Florida DOT to develop a resilience action plan for the state highway system. And I'll talk a little more about that requirement. So there's a lot going on in, in Florida and the statute in chapter 339 requires, you know, or identifies some goals for the resilience action plan, recommending strategies to enhance resilience, design changes, uh, enhancing partnerships and, you know, providing technical assistance. And we're happy to have an opportunity to showcase all the things that we were already doing and incorporating those into one plan that will, will help raise, raise awareness about the things that 
we're doing and the things that you know, we can do to improve our resilience. So there are some required elements of the resilience action plan, including a review of historic and current issues, a review of FDOT's policies and procedures, uh, identifying alternatives for retrofitting and for design, developing a database of vulnerable assets, and doing a vulnerability assessment of the state highway system. And this plan is due to the governor and legislature by June 30th, 2023. So, and then it has to be updated every three years. So we have a number of activities that we already had underway that are helping us address some of these issues. And then we're doing additional analysis and work to um, incorporate these plans. So our original intent was that this plan would also meet the requirements of the, the optional resilience improvement plan that's included in the federal protect funding. So we're hoping that most of the work will meet those requirements, but we're seeing that there are some additional items that we'll need to incorporate into the resilience improvement plan, including expanding to cover the full national highway system elements in, in Florida. We will also, as I mentioned earlier, take the resilience action plan and incorporate information as appropriate into the transportation asset management plan. So this is one of the ways that we're looking to enhance the TAMP in our asset management program. So we, as part of the resilience action plan, we're identifying strategies. So as part of our self-assessment that we did previously, we had identified some strategies, identified some areas where we really need to focus. And so what you're seeing here are the strategy areas that we're focusing on, planning and PD&E, design and construction, operations and asset management. There's a lot of different ways that we could kind of separate these, but this, these seemed like some, some buckets that make sense for us. And then within each of these strategy areas, we'll have some consistent categories of actions across the board, including policy, emergency management, collaboration, decision-making, and data. So we're looking to have a pretty robust set of strategies in, in the plan. As part of the vulnerability assessment, we're focusing on some of the water related hazards as required. Um, the statute identified specific hazards that we needed to address in the plan. So we're with this iteration, we're using the data that we have available and doing the uh, widest statewide look that we can to look at areas where there are hazards where, and identify the transportation facilities that should be considered, should have resilience um, considerations incorporated into them, or at least be analyzed as they, as they go forward. Um, we are talking about incorporating resilience analysis into any project that we do as well, but we're trying to identify some priority areas. So we've looked at sea level rise, storm surge, flood hazards, and we'll use additional data as we develop updates to the plan. Now I wanted to just talk for a minute about the Federal Protect Program that Tom gave an overview of, of earlier in his, in his slides. And we are getting both formula funding and then there's a discretionary component. We have decided at FDOT to allocate the formula funding to the districts for them to program and implement projects that they identify. Um, we had helped with some early identification of projects and continuing forward, we, the districts will be identifying uh, projects that will meet the requirements of the PROTECT funding. We're also developing a tracking method for resilience elements that can help us identify what we've done related to resilience, not just for the PROTECT program, but also help us to identify future projects that incorporate resilience. And then I mentioned the resilience improvement pro plan earlier that we are intending to um, add to our resilience action plan to meet that requirement as well. And we'd like to add a 
safety message to all of our slides. So don't drive into the unknown and stay away from flooded streets. So with that, I will stop and hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions. I think I'm going to just talk about this slide, Jennifer, before we open it up for questions, but that was great. Thank you. Um, and just looking at some of the questions that are coming in, I think this is a great slide to point to. So um, putting in a shameless plug uh, for my former employer, FHWA, because they've got a great website and it's linked here. You can use the QR code to get you there when, when you get the slides or, or right now on the screen. And um, just a wealth of resources and more to come. And so you can find things like hydro relevant hydraulic engineering circulars um, that you know can that address resiliency and give you some ideas. Um, not a lot on the resilience improvement plans that we've talked about yet, but I do know uh, that they intend to issue some some guidance on on the RIPs. Um, you know, the only thing that is covered now with respect to those plans is in the protect guidance that came out. That memo is linked on the website. And so if you kind of follow follow the links to the to the memo, to the guidance, there's a, uh, a couple paragraphs there on the content of resilience improvement plans. Uh, someone had asked about nature-based solutions. Um, what I do know is that FHWA was doing some research on that. And uh, there is a link on the website to, to that information on that research that's ongoing. Uh, not sure of the time frame and when that they're going to complete that work, but a great resource uh, for you to take away from our conversation today, because um, it may help address a lot of the questions. Okay, now I think I will turn it to Jim, who's going to moderate the Q&A. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Jennifer, uh, for some very informative discussions and presentations here. Um, you've already taken a stab at a couple of um, responses on here, Tom, and I appreciate that. Um, we have a question here about nature-based solutions, um, and this one I'd like to hear from Jennifer a little bit. Uh, you mentioned that it's part of what you're doing. How do you anticipate nature-based solutions being ranked and supported, okay, in the program that you're looking for uh, implementing on the resiliency uh, program? Well, nature-based solutions are something that we have been using for quite a while on our projects. As we evaluate alternatives for our projects, we look at ways to enhance the environment and our, our communities and also ways that nature-based solutions can help maintain the facilities better uh, and you know look at different ways. So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether or not a nature-based solution is, is the best solution for that project. And as part of the resilience action plan, we're looking at different ways of prioritizing and determining what solutions would rise to the surface and, and how that would be evaluated, um, but also looking at different ways that we might design our facilities and, and you know, what's going to be the best in the long run um, is as far as that design. So it's just, it's something that we're incorporating and, and we're, it's very important. There's a lot of interest in making sure that we're enhancing and preserving the environment as well as providing the transportation facilities and the access for our communities. Okay, thank you. Another question here uh, just jumped on me. So on the updates for the resiliency, if you're working on specifically uh, tasks like evaluating sea level rise and defining impact ranges and other historical data, you mentioned that you had like a risk register that was applied uh, and probabilities of occurrence, high, low, medium, you know, how does that work into the register? Is it similar to what we do on other risk registers related to uh, projects? I think there's a lot of interest from those of us who operate in the design and evaluation side of things, understanding how that's gonna work, Jennifer. 
Right. So mostly what we're doing right now is applying the risk register kind of at a, a statewide asset class level, um, looking at hazards statewide in our in our TAMP. It's kind of the generalized likelihood and consequences. And then as part of the resilience action plan, we're looking a little more at criticality and, and how we can determine where our the the most vulnerable facilities likely to be or what areas of the state have the highest pr uh, probability and likelihood that they're going to be affected and then look at those facilities as we do work on those facilities or we identify specific problems so we're not getting at this level yet into that detail that's kind of coming as we implement and fund projects and that's one of the reasons the PROTECT funding is allocated to the districts because they're the ones who know the details about their facilities and where their issues are. Thank you. Another question here was asked about the type of uh, software and data sites that you're uh, applying for weather impacts, floods, hurricanes, and uh, the like. What what sources is FDOT using? I know there's several um, but I understand also Florida has been pretty good about trying to standardize some of the things they're doing. Right. So right now for this initial version of the resilience action plan, we're using the um, more generalized information. We're using a total sea level rise of we're looking at one, two, three and, and five feet, um, not necessarily the projections of when those uh, sea level rise changes will happen, but looking at what's affected at various water levels so that as we are working on those projects, we can uh, identify which, which levels to look at and, and design. We're also looking at the, um, the regular flood mapping and we're using the slosh modeling that has been done for Florida for hurricane storm surge. And so those are kind of the main, um, the main data sets that we're looking at right now. There is an agency that was established in Florida called the Florida Flood Hub. It's at the University of South Florida. And that agency is charged with taking the sea level rise projections and identifying how best to um, use them in Florida and also Look, they're developing rainfall, future rainfall data, and and ad additional data that will not be available in time for us to use this time. So we made the decision to use the readily available data to try and analyze it against our facilities and, and our hazards, and and then as we do our updates to the resilience action plan and develop the resilience improvement plan, we'll incorporate the new data as they become available. Thank you. Um, I think I skipped over a couple of questions and one of them, uh, maybe we can group the two together that are related to the grant programs. Uh, someone asked, uh, what's the timeline with respect to uh, the time between when you submit grant applications to actually hearing about receiving the funding and in the same type of uh, question, is it possible that someone can move forward with private funding on a project and apply for the grants mm -hmm. after? Uh, post uh, and these are Thanks, Jim. The, the, they're great questions. And I'm going to feel like uh, an attorney, no offense to any attorneys on the line, but I'm going to, the answer is it depends. Um, and so they, let me just go to the first question about timing of the awards. Um, there is no average time. It varies, at least not one that I've seen published. It varies depending on the complexity of the program the readiness of the application. Uh, there's just so many different considerations. I can give an example of one that, that I was impressed just how quickly it happened. There is a new, we didn't talk about it uh, much, but the Bridge Investment Program. I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with that program, but it's, it was new to IIJA. Uh, the DOT had issued a NOFO in June of 2022. And I think I'm getting these uh, timeframes right. 
and then in October uh, announced some award recipients uh, for planning grants. So um, there were three parts to that grant program. The other two parts have not been announced yet, but it kind of demonstrates what I'm talking about. The, they were able to get through that program, the planning grant aspect of it fairly quickly, not all that complex. Um, and that's that's a relatively quick turnaround if you're trying to just put things in in uh, perspective, um, you know, four or five months to from NOFO, notice of funding opportunity to award. Not all of the grant programs operate that quickly. And there's more than ever. And all of these things enter into how long it takes. Um, so no, no average time. Um, and the answer, another part of the answer I'll give also ties to the second part of the question. And that is, there is a resource in every state, and that's the FHWA division office. And I, I highly encourage that if you are thinking about a grant application for any of the programs that we've talked about or others, reach out and touch base with those division offices. They are your point of contact. They can answer some of the more complex questions um, about eligibility and timing um, than, than we're able to here today. Uh, so the, the second part of the question was uh, also, and it depends, and that's, uh, can we move forward once we've, uh, with a project with some private funding and then apply for the grants? Um, you know, it depends on the details of the project. I think in some cases that demonstrates a commitment to the project and a sharing of costs. But there's a lot more to the consideration than than just those factors. So it's an it depends. It's not a, a killer of a project if you've already started investing in it, but it depends on your compliance with things like NEPA. Um, and you know the fact that you just funded some project portions with federal money doesn't necessarily mean you comply with everything you would need to comply with on a federally funded project. So there a lot of different considerations, but it's not a, a clear yes or a no that I could give you here today. Okay. Um, I think that said, of course, it also, like you said, depends on the priority of the project is a big emphasis to that, right? Yeah. Uh, you come in with hat in hand after your stock construction might be a little different scenario. So I think a yellow flag caution there for treading on those waters, right? Yes. Uh, I'm going to direct this question to Jennifer. Um, do you mind sharing uh, with us some of the mitigation strategies uh, that might be included in the resilient action plans? It might be a little early. But just kind of give us a 10,000 foot level. Uh, you know, we've got engineers on the line, right? They're already looking to delve right into this and 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 work side by side with an agency like Florida DOT on this type of stuff. But if you can give us the 10,000 foot level about what FDOT has been thinking. Uh, I think that's where the answer is, is looking at it. Well, yeah, uh, so we have been looking back through some of the work we did in as part of the Florida transportation plan where we had a resilience subcommittee that included professionals from around the state who are already working on resilience. And in there, in that process, we got some detailed resilience strategies that were much, you know, like at the 10,000 foot level as opposed to the 50,000 foot level of the Florida transportation plan. So there was a lot about looking at different design uh, standards and processes and, and how you incorporate resilience in, into those processes like the pd &E process and, and what kind of analysis you do. I don't see the resilience action plan as as providing those standards or, or design specifics about design, but identifying the areas where we need to do further work on looking at our processes and looking at our manuals. We have a lot of conversations about, you know, elevation of roads versus letting roads be overtopped so that once, if it's a storm, once the water goes away, the road is still functional and maybe you have to remove the debris. Um, so we're still in conversation about a lot of those areas. But again, this is a plan and it's a statewide plan. So it's not going to have the detailed engineering you know, guidelines that we're working with the engineers and the technical folks to um, 
address that and implement those things as we move forward. But like things like our drainage manual points to HEC 17 and HEC 25 and the nature-based solutions publication that's on the federal highway page. And so we're, we're always refining the information that we, we put out. So I don't know if that is the answer you were looking for. but. <laughs> I think at this point in time, I think it is. I, I think that everybody's going to be excited to hear more as the plan rolls out and it starts getting implemented. So thank you. So time for one last question. Tom, you're going to have to put your lawyer hat back on because um, you told us about so many programs. And uh, <laughs> this question is kind of like broad of us, several of them, yeah. but it's a good question. Are utilities yeah. within the right of way eligible for funding under the program? Now, remember... That may vary on program, but I'm going to ask you as, as the lawyer, Tom Everett, how are you going to respond? <laughs> Let me put that hat on, Jim. <laughs> um, it, again, it depends. I would say in general on a highway project that is funded with federal highway program funds, uh, utilities relocations are, are eligible. But, you know, there can be a lot more to it. And um and that's where you really just have to get into the details of the specific project to understand why the utilities are being relocated. And I would say as a standalone project to just simply go in and relocate utilities, probably more of a challenge. Um, but again, I can't give you a hard yes or a no. I would really encourage you, if you have a project like that, talk to the local FHWA division office about it. But in general terms, when part of a highway project, utility relocations are eligible. As a standalone project, not as likely. So before we end, I think, Jennifer, you have something that you want to share with the listeners. Please do. Yes, I did. I just wanted to say, as you know, in Florida, we've been recovering from Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Nicole recently, and we could not do that without all of our partners, including our FDOT staff, our, our consultant partners, our communities, the other states um, that have helped us with that. And resilience is also includes recovery. And it's just a huge piece of us putting back together, putting things back better, and really moving forward with our communities. And so I wanted to thank Thank everyone um, for, for listening and for the support that you've provided to Florida and Florida DOT. And we have a nice video. It's about 11 minutes that obviously we're not going to show here, but we're going to put the link in the chat. And it's a nice video about Florida's recovery from hurricanes. So I hope you get a chance to look at it. And thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing that. And I do hope you all get a chance to take a look at that video. It's pretty um, interesting. Uh, Florida DOT is one of the agencies that does fantastic work in helping to clean up the messes that we sometimes get from these uh, climate change weather events. And there's many others uh, that I've seen. And I think all of our DOTs that step to the plate and do all this effort really deserve a huge round of applause. But for now, I'd like to thank my panelists so much for participating, putting together these presentations and helping to educate uh, our audience and myself included on some of the things that are ongoing and some of these programs. Thank you all for joining us here today and hopefully you join us again for the next uh, webinar that we carry on the topic of infrastructure resilience. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.